Always unprofessional and no expense considered. Welcome one and all this evening to this episode of The Author's Outpost, where I interview authors from across the Fruited Plains and even internationally in some cases. Uh, my guest this evening is uh, a traditionally uh, different change of pace instead of uh, one of my uh, fellow indie friends. We have Bain published uh, author Tim Akers. That's correct, right? Akers? Correct, yeah. Kind of like... Kinda like, kinda yeah, like yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm sure you've heard Green Acres jokes before about that. Uh, so. so yeah, my nickname in high school was Green, uh, and I had a, a science professor who insisted on calling me Mr. Hectares because he was clever. We're we're dating ourselves with that Green Acres reference. Holy crap! Uh, we're, we're of a certain vintage, that's for certain, Tim. Um. I, before we get started, I have a little tradition here on the live stream. Before uh, before we get started, we are going to roll the dice to see how this stream goes. Or I will. You don't have to get oh, your okay. dice. This is I for, have this is for me. Yeah. Uh, you want to get? You want to roll together? No. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I'm gonna roll mine. Works. No fudging at my table. And that's a nine. That's perfectly average. That's what she said. That's what I told her anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say hello to the chat uh, for who is here at the moment. Mr. Eric Wog, a friend of the channel. Hell, all have a good interview, guys. I may not be able to watch any streams tonight. Eric, thank you for coming in anyway. Uh, TJ over from Facebook, who found my uh, post for this stream, said, awesome, super excited. This will be my first tune in. Thank you, uh, sir. We appreciate you. Uh, hail to Legends of the Brave Bard. Hail to Paladin Dragoon Rider. Who also and hail Legend of the Brave Bard says this is the place for me farm living and hail to Hunter P Herman author Hunter P Herman uh the Lore Forge. Thank you all for being here with us at the start of the stream. And Mr. Tim, uh, you have you are not uh, actually a newer writer in this sense. You are uh, someone who is a lot more experienced and uh, grandfathered in. Uh, as I was, you know, kind of research. I because I do research. But believe it or not, I do actually do some due diligence Excellent. for the sake of this show and the sake of the authors that come on my show. Uh, you've been at this for a good solid minute, uh, uh, yeah. writing traditional writing fantasy, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, it's hard to say. My first novel, I think, came out in 2009. I'm on my ninth now. There was a sort of a break there in the middle. Um, but, like, I, I, I do both traditional, like, novel writing. And I also write for, for games, for role-playing games. Uh, and those bylines are even older. Uh, my first sold story was in 1994 um, for White Wolf Game Studios back in the day. So, yeah, I've been at it for a minute. It's it's uh, it's been a while. It's been a while. Uh, and that's an that's an interesting take too, because you see some uh, some. There's a lot of uh, good little crossover when it comes to uh, writers who are involved in the tabletop gaming space, as well as writing their own uh, books. You know, uh, probably the most famous example is uh, the book that got me into fantasy, which is uh, the Dragonlance novels. Um, you know Tracy Hickman and Margaret Weiss, who inspired me to write my own uh, my own works. Uh, I interviewed uh, Blaine Lee Pardue of BattleTech fame not that long ago, and uh, he's still pumping out books like crazy. Yeah, BattleTech was my first like war game. I mean, I started with Avalon Hill bookcase games, and um, sort of graduated from there into into BattleTech and more into war games than into role playing games. I got into RPGs. <clears throat> Not really until almost, I mean, I did some in high school, but also college uh, was when I really started um, started doing the, the tabletop role-playing side of it. And uh, I'm the kind of guy who, I, I can't just be a fan of something, I got to be a creator too. Like I, I'm very <laughs> driven in that in that sense. So oh, as, soon as, I got, that. Seriously, yeah, as soon as I seriously got into RPGs, I was like, you know what? this is what I'm doing for a living. And it's not what I ended up doing for a living, but I was very serious about it for, for four or five years there. And then, uh, you know, got out of it, came back. It, it goes around. It does. And you know, it's, I, I was never, uh, I was a bit of a late bloomer when it comes to the tabletop role-playing games myself. I didn't start playing uh, D and D until fifth edition and late 2018. Someone gave my son a starters, uh, a starter kit and, 
Yeah, no, I remember, uh, and I heard you in a, another interview say that you were kind of caught, your family was kind of, uh, you, you grew up in a bit of a religious household, so your family was very caught up in the satanic panic, and so was mine. Yeah. Uh, I was not able to play D&D in its uh, big heyday, but... I, I wasn't either, actually. I mean, I was, my my parents prevented me from, from playing D&D directly. I was allowed to play um, Middle Earth role playing because Tolkien's a Christian, and... Um, they were comfortable with that. Uh, and the very first couple of sessions I ran, um, I went to a small uh, evangelical Christian school in, in um, junior high and, and high school, um, part of high school. And uh, after a couple of sessions, like the parents got wind of what we were doing and I had to run a session with the parents there <clears throat> before they would let us continue. Um, which was incredibly awkward uh, and and certainly uh, not not conducive to a truly creative <laughs> experience. But you know that's all right. They were just taking care of their kids. They you know didn't really fully grasp what was going on either way. So to this day, um, you will not find my books prominently displayed in my parents' house. Uh, no offense <laughs> to them. Uh, it's more a matter of like. They don't want people coming over and seeing <clears throat> this cover, you know, on their on their shelf. And that's that's OK. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, I, I don't think that I think the nuance of, uh, you know, having dynamic covers of, you know, depictions of good, you know, uh, good versus uh, a seemingly unconquerable evil on the front row really reaches uh, some folks that don't understand it. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all the all they see is big demon and, and figure, well. Yeah, you know, clear. a lot of the conclusions that led to kind of the satanic panic and, uh, yeah. you know, a bit of misinformation in that area. Uh, so the back in that day, that was about the time you kind of decided to you wanted to write for a living. Uh, you wanted to be more in the role playing side or did you uh, pick oh, no, novels I, first? I definitely wanted to be a writer, like from the very beginning. Uh, I wrote my first novel when I was in, I think, seventh grade. Um, and that that's always been like my my target and my goal. Um, I got busy. I got married fairly young and just didn't like, I had a job and really wasn't applying myself to the actual, the actual writing. Um, and so it was, wasn't until I turned 30 and I woke up one day and I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm old now. Now I look back and laugh, but I was like, Oh, I'm old now. I gotta get, I gotta get at it if I mean to actually do this. And uh, so back then, the indie scene was not what it is now. Let's just say that no, uh, traditional no, publishing not. was was really the only reasonable path. And not only that, but like there was an accepted way of getting into trad publishing, which was establish a name for yourself in short story markets. Do that long enough that you attract the attention of an agent and then move on to novels. Um, and that's what I did. Like I, I went out. I, on my 30th birthday, drove out and down to Borders and Barnes and Noble and bought all of, you know, Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, Fantasy Magazine, As uh, Asimov's Science Fiction, and Analog, I, everything that they had on the shelf, which was, you know, I think two months supply, and read all of it, and then started writing short stories, just turning them out, submitting them, getting rejection notes, uh, and just keeping at it, figuring out, you know, who to submit to, how to submit best, um, all of those procedural details that are less important now because everything is pretty much online. Uh, you know, setting up self-addressed stamp envelopes to send stuff back and just that entire, that entire business of, of getting, getting published um, in that traditional manner. For some reason, at the same time, I decided I wanted to write young adult um, which I didn't read a lot of young adult, so I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, <laughs> so I wrote a young adult novel called The Kingdom of Doors and Rooms and began submitting that to agents. And I really just was just sort of throwing myself out there, you know, any, any possible avenue I could, I could figure out, I, I followed. Um, and the short story publications, they, those eventually started racking up. Um, but I am not a short story writer. Now, um, I've, I've written a lot of them and I've sold a lot of them. So that's sort of almost a misnomer, but I struggle with plotting that short of a thing. Um, 
I really am better at the at the novel size ideas, the epic. I mean, there's a reason I write. There's a reason I write epic fantasy. You know, I have big ideas, and trying to put a big idea into a small into a small story is a struggle. It's not not easy. A lot of my early um, writing group feedback from folks was, "Well, this is a novel." And you've tried to write it in 5,000 words and it's not going to work. <laughs> you need to stop. <laughs> yeah. And so. I, fe I feel that myself because uh, like the first at least 15 years of when I was writing, I started writing in uh, 1993. Uh, and a lot of that was just hobby writing. And the more, as I kind of got into the mid 2000s, I started to realize, you know, this is, I, I had this self-aware moment of, you know, I'm probably good enough to, go ahead and go at it for a novel instead of these little, you know, piddling short stories and trying to get into that mindset of how to take a story to book length was really an interesting learning process. Cause I didn't have anyone at that time to teach me or show me how, and you kind of had a lot of it. You had to figure out alone. There's at least a half a dozen half finished novels uh, that are, uh, you know, better left in the dustbin of my writing history that uh you know trying to figure out well what comes next okay and then what and then what and how to progress till novel length and you know, finally just in this last couple of years i just it just clicked you know yeah. <laughs> and again I, I say that to writers a lot the only way to really learn how to do this i mean there are classes and there's you know sanderson's thing online on youtube that you can follow and stuff the only way to learn how to do it proper is to just actually just do it and yeah. write a bunch of novels and keep writing novels until you know and so you're doing it right um you know i i talk about this a fair amount but you know sanderson we, we only see what he's actually had out there he wrote i think like 14 novels, novels before yeah, he before, got except before first one came out mm -hmm. and um unfortunately fortunately or unfortunately a lot of my early novels are on are on that shelf back there you know um because uh i was good enough of a sentence writer and a character writer and a world builder to make sales um and it you know i really kind of learned a lot of it live and in public you know um my early stuff was not really, really well plotted honestly i mean the, the veridon books are good i enjoy them and those have the most loyal fans of any of my any of my series um but i i was just kind of making up how to do a plot that, you, know, as I went. <laughs> you were uh, pantsing it the whole time yeah like i i thought i was outlining it but i i wasn't i was doing sort of jim butcher's uh yes but system where like you ask a plot question can so and so steal the plans and then you say yeah he gets them but you know, he <laughs> manages to set the mansion on fire and now he's got enemies. You know, you sort of like develop, you just sort of create problems and create problems. And, and it's this cycle until eventually the thing just runs out, you know, until the problem gets so big that you've saved the world or destroyed it. So. Well, the fact that you've got passionate fans about it, that's a testament that you must have been doing something right, you know. Yeah, um, it's it was a lot of world building stuff for that. That's that's a really weird book. Um, and it it's not the kind of book that has a lot of analogs it's um you know it's a unique system it's a unique world uh so people who like super dark steampunk noir um stuff with really like weird world building uh love that series um but it's not it's not got a lot of general appeal let's say it's no one's gonna make a movie about it I would say that's that's actually something from my perspective as a reader, because you got to understand as much as I love writing, too. I've, I've been a voracious fantasy reader for a long time. And that's always that was what led me into wanting to write is, uh, you know, reading and cutting my teeth on the uh, Star Wars expanded universe. And, you know, my first few fantasy novels in the 90s and then, you know, really delving into the genre in the 2000s and, uh, over the years. Is, I think uh, you really you really have to be a voracious reader to be a, a good writer. There are so many writers now who are like, "Oh yeah, no, I I write, you know." But what, what's the last book that you read? And they're like, "Well, I'm a big fan of Heinlein. Cool. You know, he's <laughs> he's been dead forever. Uh, read something new, you know." Uh, and so, just sort of staying up with the content uh, yeah. is, is part of 
part of the job that people yeah, really focus on. Def definitely some interesting trends in reading these days. You know, Sanderson's big, but uh, the point I was trying to make was uh, Grimdark is very popular these days, especially amongst uh, a lot of the uh, uh, the booktubers and uh, you know online reviewers. They they love their grim, dark, and gritty. Uh, a lot of these books you see up here are some uh, really grim, dark ones. I, I think a lot of these guys might actually be in competition with each other to have the most violent and dark opening chapter imaginable. Like. Guys, calm down. Are you? <laughs> what is this a competition to see who's the who's the most bleak? Who's yeah? Who's who's the most internally broken? Um, <laughs> what are you projecting here, guys? Or do you really just child. want blood and guts? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, well, and see, like after, after a certain point, you're just kind of throwing words around. You're not actually like developing a world. It's just violence, um, and that's that's true for any trend, though, right? Like. Um, I mean, I like Grimdark. I, I've Joe Abercrombie's uh, First Law trilogy is that's some of the best fantasy I've read. I love love Mark Lawrence, um, and I love that a lot of stuff in that line. But at the same time, like I I like a little light in my books. Yeah. Um, the the book that really changed the way that I think about writing was Neuromancer by William Gibson back in the mid '80s, and uh, all of his books have always been portrayed as being really, really dark because they are kind of, but they always end with a hopeful note. He always has um, some ascent that uh, the characters get out They're They, you know, they're stuck in a cycle and then they leave uh, and they move on with their lives. And that's not, you know, that common in, in grim dark. <clears throat> like I stopped reading Abercrombie, um sometime around uh, best served cold because it was just terrible people doing terrible things to each other in unpleasant ways and like i don't like any of these people like why <laughs> I, I do i want to watch it's, them suffer no it's a it's a a bit of a balancing act when it comes to grimdark stuff because i and i think definitely in the last decade or so we see a lot more content that uh, kind of rides that kind of uh late 90s grit gritty edge and uh you know uh, grim dark stuff like you know, walking dead the boys and um but i think some people kind of take it some authors can kind of take it a little too far it, sometimes it feels like everybody's trying to be berserk uh i don't know if you've ever read uh berserk the uh, manga, the long running manga series no but, i i'm not a manga guy i mean i i've read some but i'm not i'm not up on it yeah, and, but a lot of authors forget how to. You've got to have that connective tissue of hope in that there is some kind of light at the end of the tunnel. Because if it's uh, if that is, like you said, just uh, terrible people doing terrible things constantly over and over, then it, it essentially kind of becomes trauma porn to me. You, you've got to... Uh, uh, something as grim and dark shouldn't sust can't sustain itself like that. You, you kind of need that you know emotional breather yeah. uh, from a yeah. lot of things. Otherwise, it just you know, again, it just is dark and it stays dark. You yeah. kind of need the light to contrast with it. Uh, Christopher Brenning's a grimdark author uh, and a friend of the channel who uh, does that very, very well. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. His book, The Hellborn King, fantastic read. And uh, I'm going to go to the uh, chat for a second here because I've got to address uh, one of my little people here. Andrew Campbell, hello, good evening, good afternoon, good evening, sir, where you are. And hello to my friend Arno. Uh, Tim, I'm not going to blast your ears with Arno's intro that he has for the channel because you're a professional. I'm trying to, Arno, I'm keeping this as professional as possible. I'll play your intro on another stream when we can be more loosey goosey, but thank you. <laughs> Environmentalists are wishing me death for wanting to pollute the chat. I wish them well. Arno is, uh, he's a very, he's a, a very aggressive fan. Um, good, uh, good. But he, he does stuff that gets himself put in the corner a lot. Yeah. Uh, Bro Grimm says, Hail, did I miss the whole show again? No, sir, we are uh, still at the beginning. And Hunter P. Herman says, uh, Grimdark is Saw as a soap opera. I think that's a pretty good description of it. I haven't delved too far into uh, Berserk myself, but it's one of those things that's like, it's a, one of those, uh, I'm going to get to those series, you know, someday, at some point, just sit down and start it. Kind of like the Wheel of Time. I started that and I didn't continue with it. Yeah, I only got so far in Wheel and, and then just my energy ran out. There was too much discussion <laughs> of dresses and uh, <laughs> geography and 
it, he it, definitely it, takes his time. Yeah, he doesn't get in a hurry. Well, that's the thing. Like I, I say, I write epic fantasy, but I write pacey epic fantasy. Like I like things to happen in a in an organized fashion. You know, I like exciting things to go on, um, and I I just try to keep keep things moving. Um, so yeah, so th- like the epic fantasy where you're like, oh, we're gonna talk. 15 pages about, you know, how people wear clothes and, you know, here's uh, five pages of exposition about how the magic system works. That's not me. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm oh. going to do everything in, in interaction and movement. So, yeah, it's got to, so you're, you're like a lot of, you're what I call a kinetic author that, you know, likes to keep things moving at a certain pace. And uh, a lot of people don't understand how important pacing is to a story until, you know, you find somebody who's a little off kilter with it. And then you realize, yeah, hey, we, we've been hanging. We've been hanging around this town for a minute. Are, are, are we accomplishing anything, or uh, do we need to uh, do we need to have the orcs come in and solve and uh, yeah. liven things up a little bit? Yeah. Inferno Crusher. Um, <laughs> are you familiar, are you familiar with Inferno Crusher? Uh, no, sir. Unfortunately, yes, no, that was a a joke genre. Probably I don't know, fifteen years ago or something. But the the basic idea behind Inferno Crusher is that every story uh, ends with the Inferno Crusher which is a monster truck uh, crashing through the wall and killing all the characters. And so <laughs> it, it got used. I don't even know how much of it actually got written, but like, you know, there, you'd have this sort of a basic literary story and then Inferno Crusher would come in. Uh, or you'd have an exciting cyberpunk story and then Inferno Crusher would come in. Uh, this is it, the first it, time I'm hearing of this. This oh, is hilarious. Yeah. No, it was, it was, I mean, it was, you know, not, it wasn't widely pushed about, but like we're going to create a subgenre. It's going to call it Inferno Crusher. We're calling it back because that's the name of the monster truck that kills everybody at the end. So, yeah, it was fun. These days, everybody's trying to write Game of Thrones meets something else. I've noticed a lot is. I wrote one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, it's influ- it's influential and you're always going to get trends like that in publishing uh, where something gets real popular. I mean, how many Harry Potter clones did we see? Uh, in the wake of that series being one of the biggest in the world. Well, the, the real trick about it is like, okay, I, the Hallowed War trilogy, I, I pitched as Game of Thrones meets Miyaz- uh, Miyazaki meets um, Spirited Away. And uh, that was not, that was a good enough mix to sort of make things interesting. But the thing about it is like, if you begin writing those X meets Y sort of stories, um, you got to deliver on X and Y. And that's difficult to do, but also you have to know that everyone, and I'm thinking here in a purely traditional publishing manner, uh, you've, the editors and the acquisition people that are seeing that stuff are seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those. So you need to do just not like X, B, Y. It's got to be a really unique take on X and a really unique take on Y and, and have it, you know, that those interactions being really, really interesting. Um, the whole, you know, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies thing that, that occurred. Um, clever, but also spawned a whole bunch of, you know, classic uh, novel with zombies. And after a while, it gets boring. And then yeah. Abe Lincoln, you know, Vampire Hunter being an yes, example. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you kind of have to balance that out. You don't want to chase the market too much. No, arguably not. Arguably, what you want to shoot for is somebody else saying... Uh, comparing your work to theirs yeah. you know you want to be one of the one of the comparison uh comparisons that they put in their elevator pitch yep yep you want to be the comp yeah um when you uh and you write oh i love how my phone closed on my questions that's nice um so uh you've been you've been writing for a minute have you gotten to a are you in a good spot where it's like you've you're a well-oiled machine uh, or do you, you just kind of come into it and uh, and you have to sit and really think and daydream for a while? I'm a hot mess, um, but <laughs> I um, aren't we all? I definitely have a system that I follow. Like I'm a cosmology guy, so I I start with some very small idea, and then I think, all right, <clears throat> how am I going to make this cool, and how am I going to make it make sense? Like um, Wraithbound. Okay, so when I finished the Hollowed War trilogy, which was my Game of Thrones goes to goes to anime, um, I that was a big cast series, and that was 
you know, are almost a million words of, of epic fantasy. And I was like, this is too many characters. This is too much geography. This is too many maps. Um, this is too much heraldry. I need to sit down and I want to do something much smaller next time. So my next book, uh, I'm only going to have one character, but I need him to have someone to talk to in sort of a wise, cracky, snarky way. So I'll have a ghost uh, bound to its soul. And that's the origin story for Wraithbound, which is there on the screen, um, where I'm just like, all right, dude has a ghost in his soul. Why is that? And so then I came up with the entire magic system that, that justifies that system. And then I started working on the history of a world where that kind of cosmology works. And then you begin finding the pressure points and, and um, the interesting political stuff. And then you begin creating, you know, an actual plot. Um, so I, I start very broad and then I work down to what I think is probably a functional plot. And then I stop and figure out who my characters are going to be. And I come at it from the other direction. Um, so that I'm, I'm not just, you know, having my characters do stuff for plot reasons or for world reasons. Um, they're doing things for, for character reasons, which is kind of a trick. Um, so uh, I, I do have a system. It, it starts off very big and kind of <clears throat> pantsy, frankly. Um, but by the time I'm actually writing a book, uh, I've, I've formed an outline. Uh, and my outlines tend to be just mile markers that I want to get to. And then I discover right my way between the mile markers. Every once in a while, I have to stop and reorient myself uh, and see if I'm at the proper plot point or if I've kind of gotten too far to one way or the other and then work my way back towards center. So, yeah, the, the beginning and the ends are easy. It's that big mushy middle that's a little tricky to uh, work out. I um I for me for me anyway <laughs> yeah i struggle more with um i struggle more with with the parts between because in a traditional three-act structure which is actually a four-act structure uh the the middle is is the part that is in some ways the most interesting because that's the point when your main character stops being reactive and becomes active it's the point where your expectations up to that, you know, that, that the narrative have created up to that point get reversed, or you find some giant revelation that changes the direction of the story. Um, and so the way that I do my actual plotting, I usually have like an idea of what the beginning is, what the inciting incident is that's going to make things interesting. And then I come up with what the ending is going to be. And then I write the middle uh, structurally. And then I write the parts that are between the middle and, you know, the beginning and the part that's between the middle and the end. And then I write the middle between each of those. Do you see how this is working? Yeah. Um, and once I've got all of those points figured out, uh, I begin writing between them and, and uh, making sure that my, that each of those points is doing what it's supposed to do. Like I follow a traditional screenwriting format as far as, um, you know, end of act one, uh, is the point of no return. Uh, the big middle is the revelation or the reversal, uh, end of act two is the beginning of the confrontation. You have your moment of darkness. I, I structure it like that. And it's like grammar. If you do it well enough, even a reader who is aware of that kind of structure doesn't realize that they're in it until they look back on it and say, oh, you know, that must've been the moment of darkness. Um, or I've, you know, I'm about this far into the book. When's the reversal going to occur? And if you do it right, um, people don't necessarily see it coming. Um, but being aware of that structure really does change the way you read, change the way you see movies. Um, I, my poor wife, uh, sits next to me in movies and I have to poke her and I'm like, that, that was the big metal. <laughs> we just passed the moment of no return. It's it's kind of like it's kind of like when musicians, uh, you know, trained musicians uh, listen to, you know, music and they can't turn off that part of their brain that's, you know, constantly making the music. So, uh, you know, they're, they're thinking more about the technical side of it, you know, because they know how the sausage is made. Yeah. And that, I, I, get a, 
Right. It, that's definitely a part as the the reader part of me and the author part of me you know sometimes interact but definitely when i'm a reader uh, there i try to shut the author part of my brain off in order to facilitate and because i understand that the author that uh you know the, in the book that i'm holding is gonna take you know is is trying to tell me a story so like right off the bat i'm not questioning how they made it or 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 where's this going? Why is this happening? Who are these people? And I'm not asking myself questions. I'm just rolling with it. And, you know, then I kind of analyze once I'm done and look back on it and go, that was interesting how they did this, whereas other authors did this. And you know. I wish I could do that. I really, <laughs> I am, I am trapped in the, in the craftsman style where I absolutely I'm always paying attention to to what is happening. My hair is doing crazy stuff. I just got my hair cut today. It used to be down to the middle of my back. Oh, I know how this that feels. morning I woke up and I had three years of growth and I just cut it. So it's all nutsy. Um, but anyway, um, I, uh, I, I can't turn that craftsman part of my brain off and I wish I could, but also when a, when a story is really well told, um, it is an enjoyment that I never really got reading in the same way that's not quite true because i mean like i will always be chasing that first time i read wind and the willows kind of joy um but i i really um i really enjoy a well-crafted story the reverse of that is that if a book uh doesn't quite live up to those standards that i apply to my own work i get disappointed real fast um there are books that you know, win awards and sell a lot of books. And I start reading them and I'm like, well, here's obviously how the plot is going to end. Like, this is, <laughs> this is obviously going in this direction. This character is going to do this. This person's going to end up with this person. And here's how your plot's going to end up. And then I'll just hate read the rest of the book to see if I'm right. Oh, no. Usually I am. Uh, sometimes I'm not. And in those cases, <laughs> it's just like, well, you know, you fooled me. Good job. Um, but that's just, yeah, that's structurally. It's the books that I read where I, where I lose that, right? You know, can tap back into my pure reader self that, that I think the book is the, the best read, the best written. Um, and those are the ones that when I'm done with them, uh, I immediately go back with a notebook and a spreadsheet and I outline the book uh, chapter by chapter uh, to see how they've, how they've gotten to that that point um the uh, daniel abraham uh he's half the team of james s a Corey that wrote the expanse um his earlier novels uh the dragon's path which i'm sorry it's the dragon and the coin is the series um but book one is called the dragon's path that whole series is i think the best fantasy that's been written in a very long time um and it doesn't get a lot of attention. It it did okay, but um, it you know it's it's next level writing, uh, and that is the, one of the few books that I've read where I just like I read the book, loved it, didn't think about it, and then I was done. And I was like, okay, how do you do it? Like, <laughs> let's start let's start kicking the tires and taking taking the pages apart and just figuring out what it what it looks like. So, uh, yeah, I, I do a lot of backwards engineering i guess in that sense no no that makes sense you know from my experience when it comes to uh when it comes to uh the fantasies that really stand out as, as having done something unique and interesting is a lot of the time someone who's was not as someone who kind of came from outside the genre into it uh, to bring a, a unique perspective to it to make their own spin on it because uh, like you always say, you can't think outside the box until you know where the borders are. And somebody who's outside those borders coming in is not necessarily going to, uh, you know, follow those same structures. <clears throat> One, yeah, yeah go ahead. They're not, they're not going to know that they're breaking rules. They're right, not, right. And that's when you get the most interesting takes. Probably the most famous example is uh, uh, Stephen King's The Dark Tower series, which was his take on an epic fantasy, which was a a really amazing read it had its ups and its downs but for the most part it was you know uh it was a very unique take on the genre one author that i loved in the 2000s was sarah douglas who was an australian fantasy author she you've read her 
Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. You don't know how happy you've made me. <laughs> I run across so many booktubers and other fantasy readers, and almost none of them have heard of her. Well, that's, that's, I think, because of when she was prominent and also the fact that she's Australian because you just didn't get as much coverage in the U.S. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I know her. But if you know her background, she was she tried to be a romance writer first. Mm. And so when she came into fantasy, and I forget how she made that transition, she brought a lot some of that experience with her. Uh and she, you know, like her her romance was a huge part of her series. Like uh, I've always kind of I've kind of likened her these days. It's kind of like George R. R. Martin with a vagina. Like <laughs> she really hit that same kind of uh, ultra violent. Uh, sex and violent, a uh, dark violence vibe that Martin kind of put in with a little bit of the, a uh, little more on the magic side than the po the political intrigue side. Yeah. But she was very influential to me, but it was that outside influence that she brought into it that made her reading so unique. Yeah. Rest in peace, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, you, you're a miss to me at least. Um, and she's one of the few fantasy series that I've read all the way through all of her 12 books and her 10 ascendant. Uh, Tensendor series. Yeah. Um, and I don't have you ever heard of Russell Kirkpatrick? No. It, no. I don't think yeah. I don't think he got brought out much, but uh I read his his was an impulse grab at the bookstore. I was just like, this looks interesting, I'll grab it and pick it up. The covers didn't outstand too much, but when I read into uh Russell, uh, this feeds into the whole, you know, somebody with, from outside perspectives really bring a unique take. Uh he was like uh, he's like a map maker. He was, he, he was, you know, interested in geography and uh, topography and stuff like that. So naturally in his book, all the descriptions of landscapes were just amazing and oh, vibrant and alive plot wise. He's you're either going to love him or hate him because I'm reading his trilogy and it's like, he's following no structure like any fantasy book I've ever read. <laughs> You know, he, he has red herrings. He has characters you think are doing one thing and they're not. And it's like, where are you? What are you doing, dude? And by the end, it's like, I had no idea where this was going. And it was in some ways frustrating, but in some ways invigorating. Cause it's like, I don't know where I'm going. This shit is amazing. You know, this shit is uh, just off the chain and unpredictable. And it kind of, you know, it made for a very interesting read, even if it wasn't maybe, the, you know, the best fantasy novel. It was certainly the most unpredictable in my regard uh, for my uh, uh, for, for my money. That's an interesting <laughs> that's an interesting thought process, because, um, like I said, I'm, I'm a big structure guy, but I also don't think that slavishly following structure is good because um, it, it kind of ruins uh, the character portion of it. And if people are doing stuff just for character stuff, then then it tends to work better because character trumps pretty much everything, even in fantasy. Fantasy, which is a, you know, it's a concept genre. It's a genre where world building is incredibly important. And you can have the most fascinating world, you know, imaginable. Um, but if the characters aren't interesting, it really makes it hard to, to care about the world. Um, and so, yeah, and good character stuff doesn't really follow the structure in the same way. So, yeah, interesting. Russell Kirkpatrick, I'll have to look him up. Uh, yeah, it was uh, interesting. He, he, I I kind of regret, because I haven't finished his series yet, and I kind of want to know how those books, and I, when I start a book, if I do not finish a book, it bugs me years down the road. I'm like, I got to go back and find out how that ended. Uh, Mystical Monotrim, uh, to give a little context, uh, you jumped in as I was describing Sarah Douglas, and I was describing her as George R. R. Martin with a vagina, because she writes a lot of the same kind of uh, ultra violence and grim dark, and that's not ultra violence all the time, but like when it shows up, it can get pretty ugly. Uh, Sarah, have you read all her books uh, or just a few, Tim? Oh no, just a few. I just a few. I, there are very few authors that I've read all the way through. All, all the way through the series. Read. Uh, yeah. Even my favorites, like, I mean, William Gibson, I, I haven't read Agency yet, but that's, he only writes a book every like five years. So that's relatively easy to keep up with. Um, <laughs> I am a very, I, I do not finish books very quickly. Um, and so uh, there are plenty of, 
plenty of half finished books on my shelf back here, wrong side back there. Um, that I, you know, again, like a low, low tolerance for this book is not, it's not good. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to dump it. Um, pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, that's because there are so many books out there that I want to read, uh, that I don't feel the obligation to like finish a book that I'm not enjoying. Um, and that's I, under, yeah, that's understandable. And as a writer, I kind of feel like there are writers who feel like the reader owes them a certain amount of attention, you know, trust me, if you get to this part of the book, it'll get good. Um, I'm kind of the opposite of that. I feel like the author needs to earn the reader's respect and attention every page. And when you haven't done that, um, then you you don't deserve readers. You deserve your readers to, to put the book down and walk away. But not a lot of readers think that way. A lot of readers, you know, go through and read the entire book and maybe they enjoy the end so much that the first bad three fourths is worth it for them, but not for me. Like I, I, I'll just put a book down. I'll throw a book across. That segues into one of my questions that I have for you. Are you what are you reading now? Um, I am currently reading uh, The Flames of Myra by Clay Harmon. Um, and I'm going to be really embarrassed if I got that wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, Clay Harmon, that's right. I know Clay, which is why I really should I'm so bad at names. I'm just absolutely miserable at names. Um, but yeah, Flames of Myra by Clay Harmon, which is very interesting because um, I can't figure out what the world is supposed to be exactly. Everything is elemental. There's a lot of lava uh, and they live in a crater. And I think they're dwarves, but they're not described as dwarves. And there are these creatures that are um, made of stone. They're, they're stone elementals. Um, and it seems to be that they're just evolved versions of the main characters. Uh, and the magic system is really interesting. It's got a lot of, um, Clay is, Clay is a climber, uh, and is very familiar with geology and ge the geological con content of rocks is a big part of, of the magic system. And so I'm <laughs> getting into it. I'm just like, oh, this is, this guy clearly knows a lot about this subject. Uh, and is doing a good job of explaining it to me in a way that, that keeps it interesting. Um, so oh, I'm reading yeah. that. I'm reading um, the Fifth Stormlight Archive book, Rhythm of uh, Rhythm of War by Sanderson. Uh, I, I, I got to get into Sanderson. I've uh, uh, yeah. Hey, let me make a suggestion. Um, Mistborn. I used to start with Mistborn. That's what everyone say, tells me. Cons consider sticking with the Mistborn series. Stormlight Archive is this entirely other. Uh, other kind of book that um, is is really interesting in the way that it ties stuff together. And I, I really enjoy parts of it, <laughs> but there are parts of it that drive me nuts because I'm in book five and each of the books is about 400,000 to 500,000 words long. Uh, and, and yet book five is a significant portion of it is just exposition. It's just characters explaining things to each other because there's so much going on that there's no way for you to keep up with it all. And there's so much background, nitty gritty, complicated technology going on that again, you just, there's no way for you to keep up with it all or know it all. And so you've really got to, you, you've got to have characters just talk to each other about stuff and explain things to each other that they should really already know, but they're only explaining it to each other so that the reader knows. Um, and it's kind of a drag, honestly. Um, so I'm like, I'm getting through it, but it feels like homework. I'm a third of the way through the book. And <laughs> I was like, uh, I got to stop for a while and go, go do something else. Um, so those are the two main books I'm reading right now. Um, I've got a bunch of books that uh, I've started that I haven't quite finished that I'm like probably going to go back to at some point. Um, those are the main ones. Uh, I'm going to go to the chat because uh, we've got a couple questions for you. <clears throat> uh, TJ for over from Facebook says, question for you guys. When do you feel like you took a big step in your writing career? Uh, you have achieved the next level in your proficiency and skills within writing. Did you want to go that first or do you want me to? Uh, I mean, I can. Uh, now, now, admittedly, uh, I'm uh, in like the last 
editing pass of my first book, The Black Crown, which will hopefully come out in the next few months. I've got some more infrastructure things to d take care of, a cover and a website and a newsletter and, you know, all that other stuff I should have been focusing on while I was at my editor. But, you know, it's, uh, doing the YouTube thing has uh, uh, also been, you know, taking up a little bit of time. I can I can uh, add that, uh, like I was telling Tim a little earlier in the thing, it just took time for me to adjust from because I used to write stories for uh, Fiction Press, which is a kind of a sister site to uh, fanfiction.net, which I know, you know, a lot of people have heard of by this point. Uh, they had a sister site that was meant more for original fiction. So the structure of that was more like chapter by chapter. And that was how I was hobby writing for a while was just one chapter at a time and not really thinking of the big picture of how to, uh, you know, kind of move into the structure of a novel, which, uh, you know, ended up with me trying to just to figure out how to pad events. And I'll, you know, initial on the initial uh, initially for me, that was going and then they went here and then they went here and then and then, you know, and that's uh that's okay from a starting uh, point. I'm sorry. My hair keeps itching me under my hat. That's why I keep messing with it. Um, but that's, a, uh, uh, it, it just took a while to kind of figure out how to pace something to uh, a longer length. Um, but I definitely think that with the black crown the, is where I kind of have, you know, taken almost 30 years of hobby writing and 10 years of, you know, failed novel epics, uh, novel efforts and it finally found uh, finally found uh, uh, the groove that works for me. You know, I, for once, I kind of feel like, you know, I've got it. You know, it just it just clicked with me. And I think reading a lot of other novels uh, in especially my genre of epic fantasy definitely helped inform on that because I can you know see how uh, other authors do it. Ones who are, you know, traditional and ones who are, you know, a little off kilter, like I mentioned earlier. Um, everything that you read kind of informs in on that a little bit uh, until you find just, you know, what works for you. And I definitely feel having a good editor helps. Uh, I took everyone's advice and said, get, they said, get an editor. And I got uh, Morgan Newquist. Uh, she edited it. And, and thankfully, a lot of the things that I wanted to work the most did work and made a couple of tweaks. And now I feel like uh, by the end of the night, I'll have uh, what is the most uh functional version of this book I can possibly have uh, as far as the, the narrative goes. So, yeah, that's, that's tricky. The two most important things that you can get as a writer is a good writing group and a good editor. Um, and the, the writing group is interesting because it's, um, it's kind of like a focus group. Cause you, when you get a, a group of writers down at a table, they all have different skills and they all have different expectations from a book. And so, um, learning to take critique from various perspectives and melding it into something that's actually useful to you is is incredibly valuable um i i would say to answer the question um every book that i write uh teaches me a lot about the writing process i really every time i finish a book um and by finish i mean you know write uh stop writing rewrite uh, revise send it to first readers, get it back, revise, send it to editors, get it back, revise, and then fiddle with it for another, you know, month before it actually finishes a final pass. Um, every time I finish that process, I'm like, I, there's so much that I've learned in this process that I didn't know ahead of time about myself, about my plotting structure, you know, about, about the process of writing, um, things about the book that I didn't, that I, that I didn't know. And be, because of the way I, this is my full-time job, right? So every time I finish a stage of writing a book <clears throat> and it goes to say my editor or my agent or whoever, um, I immediately fall onto the next project because you kind of got to keep moving forward to get things out in a, in a timely manner. Um, I, I always take those lessons to the next the next project. And so I always feel like I am taking that next step and taking that next step and getting better. Um, like, you know, I've been at this for professionally 20 years. Like my first sale was in 2000. My first 
fiction sale was in 2003. Um, and everything that I've done between now and then is better than the thing that I had just finished. Uh, and so I'm always kind of very slowly building my way up. Um, it, 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 you know, I don't think writers ever stop learning how to do this. Uh, if you do, then you've definitely made, if you feel, if you think to yourself, I've, I've figured it out. I know how to write a book and I'm, I'm always going to be able to write a book this well. Um, then you've, you're probably actually getting worse <laughs> because, <laughs> because there's, you know, there's this, this constant process of, of improvement and, and self-analysis and self-realization. Um, and um, writing is one of those weird professions where you've got to have a really high ego to think, oh, people are going to want to read my ideas, these little stories inside my head with the fake people, you know. Uh, this is interesting enough for other people to want to pay money for. Um, and yet at the same time, you've got to be humble enough and calloused enough to take an enormous amount of rejection. Um, I have an entire desk full of, of rejection letters and uh, every time something goes out, you know, there's always negative reviews. There's always, there are good reviews and there are negative reviews. You can't write something that everyone's going to like. And there are always going to be people, be people who are just like, meh, you know, it was all right. Or the characters were slow or whatever. You know, they always have some reason to not like it. Uh, on that note, real quick, Tim, let me ask you, because I've got a lot of uh, indie author friends and they all have, uh, do you ha have one of these? They all have one of these. Do you have a one star review that someone gave you that made no sense whatsoever? Or like the reason they didn't like it was just some off the wall, arbitrary thing. Um, yeah, I wrote. My it just makes job. you laugh at it that, that it even exists. Oh, sure. I mean, like I, the one that sticks in my mind the most is my first three books were all steampunk novels, but they were, I did not write them as steampunk novels. I wrote them as new weird novels. Um, I wrote them as these are fantasy novels where instead of the base technology and cultural level being the middle ages or the Renaissance or whatever, I, I used um, the Victorian era. And I didn't really think of that as steampunk, even though that kind of is the definition I, of steampunk. I think that's called gaslight fantasy. Gas, gas lamp. Gas yeah, lamp. Gas lamp is slightly well. You <laughs> know, okay, so, it's, there's it's, so many different subgenres. It's funny. Inferno Crusher. Um, Atom yeah, atomic punk, diesel punk, yeah. iron punk. Atomic just slap a yeah. punk on the end of it. Yeah, just throw the word punk on the end, and you've, you've got an entire new genre. But um, I didn't write them as steampunk because I have a pretty clear idea of what I think steampunk is, um, which is more alternate history than it is. Um, fantasy to me um but so I, I wrote these books and one of the reviews for one of them was like this is supposed to be steampunk um but there there are no steam powered machines and there are no bullers uh and the the dress is all wrong and this is entirely unrealistic to steampunk and I'm like well okay <laughs> you know, <laughs> i guess did you enjoy the book <laughs> That's yeah. what matters. One of my one of my friends, uh, uh, Weird West author Ryan Williamson, had one. Uh, his book was just it, it was wall to wall epic pulpy style action, and someone left him a one star review that said it could have been epic. He I, he, I think he framed that and put it on his wall. Like which part was not epic? It, there was there was steampunk. Uh, there was Buffalo soldiers riding, uh, driving uh, steam powered ta walking tanks, and yeah. vampires, zombie whores, just. Uh, liz Bayou lizard men who were cannibalistic. I was like, what, what were you about epic? What more do yeah. you want? Which part were you bored by? Uh, uh, TJ says, thank you for that perspective. Uh, Andrew Campbell asks, how do you know when an idea or a concept has legs? Having a germ of an idea is like having a sneeze in a crowded room. It spreads fast and before you know it, your work in progress is gathering dust. So is, is the question, how do I know a concept that's good enough to be a book? I suppose so, Andrew. If you yeah. want to leave that uh, in the, uh, if you want to leave that in the uh, in the chat, uh, let us know. I can tell you from my perspective, it, I've got an imagination that never stops. Like I just daydream constantly when I'm at yeah. work, when I'm doing yard work, when I'm 
you know, just going place to place. And I've been that way since I was a teenager. And that's kind of where almost all the stories come from. And these days, 100% of what I'm putting on the page is something I'm just, I'm living in my own world in my head and just dreaming up what's happening there. So, uh, and so my stories are organic like that. A lot of what happens or a lot of aspects of the book are just daydreamed by me driving to my job. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's how that's 100 percent how all of my my cosmology works. Like I, I always start with a very small seed of an idea and then sort of unfold from that. So um, anything can be a, a, a book from a simple concept. The, the series that I'm working on now um, after the Wraith Bound stuff uh, is called Bladecaster. And the basic idea is, would it be cool if um mages would would fight each other but their wands were actually just swords and so you could like block physically block and change the direction of a, a spell with your sword um and it it created this entire like again cosmology and world building and stuff um but like you know spells are the kata that you do with the sword and then if you come over and you repost the sword and it changes the form of the spell that you're casting and now you have to manage that and somehow get the the magical power to to not backfire and, and do something you didn't didn't intend it to do uh and so like that's a very simple concept uh and i have at least five books outlined for it you know it doesn't take a lot of of um energy to to create something like that i mean very famously jim butcher um it was like give me two disparate ideas and i'll make a, a series out of it and uh the guy was like sure pokemon and the roman empire and he wrote i don't even know how many books four or five books on that you know um <laughs> and they were all new york times bestselling not books so i guess he got it, it uh, that's someone who that's someone who definitely trusts in their imagination to uh pull it do a lot of the work for them yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think any concept that you have, like there are no, actually there probably are bad ideas, but the, the quality of your idea is actually much less, less important than the execution of the idea. You can take a terrible idea and make a great book out of it. Um, it really like, I realize that both fantasy and science fiction are, are the literature of ideas, but the quality of your idea really is much less important than your ability to tell a compelling story with interesting characters and a well-realized work. Like those, those skills will get you farther than having the perfect idea. Um, and in fact, uh, a lot of new writers worry that like, you know, other writers are going to steal their ideas. Most writers are just drowning in ideas. Um, and it's not going to be a, a matter of, you know, your idea being better or worse. I mean, Harry Potter, that's like the fifth book that's like that. You know, uh, it just is the first one that was done well or well enough. Um, I get to a couple more comments that we got in the chat. And uh, I think we'll uh, take like a quick little uh, quick little uh, bio break, as they call it, sure. um, just to uh, uh, stretch the legs and use the restroom real quick. And uh, we'll come back and we will talk uh, uh, specifically about Wraithbound, your uh, most recent release. Uh, let me get to the chat. Uh, that was good questions too. Um, I think there's one more question someone wanted to ask. Uh, Mystical Monotrum, what's your approach to experimenting with format in your storytelling? I've been trying to work with two POVs for book two of my series and five acts in book three. You, you do whatever you do whatever works for the story um, and whatever you're comfortable with. Like I, I technically follow a three act series. But um, I also do bracketing, which is the system where um, you come up with all your subplots. You know, here's my magic system subplot, my mystery subplot, my character relationship subplot, my character relationship with this other person subplot. Uh, and then you say, what is the plot question for this subplot? And what's the answer going to be? And then what are all the steps necessary between point A and point B? Uh, like what, what has to be resolved to get there. And then for each chapter, you just take one or two points from each of those brackets and you 
put them together so that like you've got magic system stuff happening in the same chapter with character relation stuff and you're doing a little bit of world building at the same time um and so you've got an idea of like what this particular scene and chapter needs to accomplish and then you just make it as cool as you possibly can um from a like a scene building uh you know dial it to 11 kind of way um so like i don't don't feel like you have to use just one system through throughout um play around and learn what works best for you but also don't lean so so hard on a particular structure that that the structure becomes the novel as opposed to like the novel itself that's a terrible way of saying that but like if you're really focusing on structure too much then you are going to lose track of character and lose track of world building and you're going to be focusing on yeah you know, i'm at the end of act two i've got to do X or or maybe making the characters act out of character just in order to fit with the structure right. just so the structure is uh fulfilled in. yeah like i said earlier they're doing they're doing things for plot reasons and not character reasons you screwed up you gotta stop <laughs> take a step back think about your characters uh, well like captain morbosa said this uh the the rules are more like guy uh, the rules are more like uh guidelines than hard set rules you know yeah. um go to the chat for uh for a minute uh mr timo berman thank you for coming in sir howdy and uh foxfly pro thank you for coming this evening may i applaud mr eckers on a tidy home too many authors have a messy office well wow. I, I uh I, that table there is yesterday was covered with uh, an army of ogres and uh i <laughs> i dusted and, and cleaned that so uh but this is like i'm here you know yeah. 18 hours a day <laughs> so <laughs> I, I like to keep it as clean as possible also the dirty parts are a little bit of, like you can't see over here which is my painting table uh with all my miniatures on it and my unassembled models so i'm i've this very particular avenue is very clean uh ba turner friend of the channel hail good uh thank you for coming in pa i forgot i always, always mess this up in my hair uh, periapsis press hail thank you for uh coming by uh, there's some discussion about uh, what's punk in the. Uh, I think uh, Paladin Dragoon Writer was suggesting that you were uh, writing Victorian punk. Yeah, I'm very comfortable with the with the term uh, new weird or, or noir weird, um, but I'm okay with calling it steampunk because it just makes it easier for people um, to yeah to attach something to. As long as the concept doesn't uh, unnecessarily impact their reading of it, like. Um, I'm careful what I call my fantasy novels because if you say sword and sorcery, people think X. And if you say epic fantasy, they think Y. And you really kind of have to be, I just say fantasy, you know. Yeah. I write, write fast-paced fantasy novels. That, that's what I do. And then you go back far enough in time, you know, everything was fantasy. Science fiction was fantasy. Superheroes were fantasy. It was all, I've always believed that the, uh, the uh, genre designations we're an invention of the, sorry, I was having hiccups for a second. <clears throat> we're an invention of the uh, bookstores to try and just separate. Okay. The magic stuff goes here. The tech, the high tech stuff goes here. Yeah. yeah it's more of a and marketing, it's, it's a marketing ploy, which is to, not. To stuff. me, it's all fantasy. It's uh, especially, and a lot of people don't think about this. Westerns are fantasy. If you think about it, because it, the way they're presented is so divorced from reality and how they're presented in, in, you know, modern, uh, not modern, yeah, modern media in the sense of, you know, how it's, come about in the last hundred years is uh just divorced from reality it's uh it is essentially a fantasy and that's that's why those uh genre mashups where you have like fantasy characters in a western setting work because uh it all has that kind of epic uh, fantasy mythological feel to it yeah. to the way the stories are told yep um all right guys we're gonna take a quick little break and i'll come right back uh, please enjoy this music in the meantime. Thank you. 
All right. I'm going to wait for Tim to get back. In the meantime, I'm going to address anything I can see in the chat. <clears throat> Excuse me. Should have done that during the break. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, coming by. And if you have a chance, uh, we are live on uh, YouTube, my Facebook page, which is just my personal page. But uh, I figured that's where uh, some people were kind of listening at. Uh, we're also live on Rumble. If you guys could go over to Rumble and give a uh, give a like and drop a, something in the chat, give a view over there. Uh, trying to grow the channel uh, over on the Rumble side of things. Uh, Rumble's really uh, kind of coming up. And uh, in the uh, new tech world, and uh, I think growing on Rumble is going to be a big thing for a, a lot of people, especially uh, in the uh, creative space. Uh, I see you, Tim. I'm just waiting for you to get ready. Um, and uh, hopefully over on Odyssey uh, at some point too, because we are trying to we're trying to grow the channel, trying to get more and uh, in, more uh, interesting people on different platforms so that uh, we're able to introduce more introduce more people to new authors, new content creators, new things like that. Um, and you can use all the gamer words you want over on Rumble. They are uh, not that picky. <laughs> uh, Tim, welcome back. Uh, to anyone who can uh, help us uh, grow over on Rumble, that is be most appreciated. <clears throat> I don't know how many people we've got going on. Uh, we did have uh, Mr. Brian McCoppin, who is a friend of the channel, saying, uh, giving some uh, compliments to the artwork for your latest book, Wraithbound. Uh, that was not the only uh, compliment you got. And I got to say, uh, that's a that's a damn good cover. That's definitely what I look for when I'm, you know, just browsing for uh, fantasy titles. Uh, when they can catch my eye like that, uh, you mission accomplished. That has uh, I've been sold on more fantasy novels by a kick-ass cover than anything else. And then no blurb or or concept or anything. Yeah, uh, it's ninety percent the the cover. Yeah, that's that's a. I've been very happy with my Bane covers. That's um, Jeff Brown is the artist. Uh, you can find him at uh, just Google Jeff Brown Illustrator. You'll find it. Uh, and when the editor introduced us because there's the stage where like um, the the uh, the artist has been hired uh, and has got a process of the book but doesn't have you know a real doesn't have any direction. There is a stage at which the um, the author comes in and describes what they think is a, appropriately a cinematic scene for a cover, uh, and I gave him a couple of ideas. And, uh, and then I went and looked at his website and went through his portfolio and was like, I cannot wait to see what you do with this world because it's a world of big monsters and, and sort of cinematic, uh, crazy stuff going on. It's, it's a, it's a really brilliant, brilliant time, but I've been very happy with that. Um, I also had, um, the Nightwatch series, uh, got that cover and this one, um, by the brilliant Todd Lockwood. I was when they told me they were hiring Lockwood. I was uh, I was very happy. I like Todd. Todd's a good guy, and he's he's an amazing artist. And a lot of covers have moved away from the sort of illustrative, very descriptive, evocative covers, especially in traditional. It's a lot of uh, clip art, in my opinion. And um, having a cover that is that is painted and designed by an artist um, for the for that specific novel is is a privilege it's an honor and I, i'm very happy with with uh, oh yeah with definitely uh, the, i think a lot of <clears throat> excuse me a lot of a lot of traditional more bigger house uh, publishers have kind of moved away because obviously the uh uh obviously the the what you call the clip art ones are a little easier and you know probably cheaper uh to produce but i i think it that also speaks to a fundamental misunderstanding of the fantasy of fantasy fans in general and that you and i maybe there's maybe it's a little different these days with some of the newer demographics that have come into the genre if you and i from our generation it, these are definitely the kind of covers that pulled you in to begin with yeah you know yeah. uh the larry elmore's and uh frank frazetta's of the world you know it's it's that evocative image of something that you are not uh, that you are not going to find in your world that really kind of helps draw you in. Yeah, I I think honestly that um, 
younger readers are more into this stuff. I mean, manga is huge, and that's not because uh, the writing is necessarily great. They're, they're they're a very visual generation. Yeah, I think that um, publishers are making a mistake moving away from that in their covers because uh, you're failing to to ignite or engage with the reader at the browsing level, especially online. I mean, it's great, you know, on a shelf, but uh, the majority of the books on the shelf, this is what you see, you know, it's just, yeah. uh, it's kind of hard to get, get everything face out. Um, but online, everything is face out. It's oh, yeah. smaller, but it still is, it, and it needs to be sort of jumping off the stage. That said, like, um, uh, Travis Baltry's book, uh, Legends and Mates, which is a, a very entertaining um, novel, started off as an independent novel, and Tor picked it up. And uh, the first thing they did was get rid of the cover and replace it with this, sorry, Tor editor's crap uh, font fixture and a little piece, little clip art of, of uh, a coffee cup. And there was an outcry online of just like, what are you doing? Like we, that we, I, I bought it before, before Tor had their hands on it. Uh, I, I remember when it came out, it made a lot of waves in the, uh, the indie yeah. fantasy yeah. scene. It, it was a, a very entertaining book. I mean, it wasn't necessarily, you know, exactly what I want to read every time I read a book, but it was a nice change of pace. Yeah. And it was a good book. Um, I was and- curious. I'm, I'm, I've been kind of curious if, if that would hold my attention because it has two things that I really love. Look, Tim, if you, if you know me, there's there's two things in life I really like. I like orcs. The the my first book is that's the subject of my first book. The hero of my book right. is a half orc, and I love coffee. It's it's a practically a part of the channel's brand. Okay, but at the same time, you know, it's also a lot of things that don't really appeal to me. It's a you know a, a post adventure, cozy read. And, you know, I was kind of wondering if that would, uh, but hearing you say that you enjoy, you know, I, everybody says they love it. So I'm I curious. Enjoyed it. I, I want to be clear though. Like there are no stakes. <laughs> it, is, it is a very, it's very much just a cozy read kind of, you know, and it, it's very short. Like I read it really quickly. I'm not a fast reader. Um, so there's not a lot of commitment there. Um, so it's relatively easy to, to enjoy yeah. and get through fairly quickly. Uh, don't expect to have your life changed by it, but um, it's still, it's still fun stuff. You know, it's a satisfying read in the way I, that, uh, books. Can I mean, be. on the, on the subject of covers, just before we get to your book, if I, if I can say, um, where trad pub has been, except for Bane, Bane is still going with those solid old school kind of covers that I've, you know, I've noticed. Uh, but a lot of, uh, the, the bigger publishers for fantasy, uh, they have dropped the ball with covers Indie fantasy, they have absolutely been killing it. This one's one of my favorite ones right here. The Seventh Cadence by Jim Wilborn. That cover is beautiful. Yeah. And it does exactly what it should. It grabs the eye. Yeah. And no, I, was- I agree. I agree with that. I think that um, there are cases of good trad publishers out there uh, still doing Bane does well. I think Orbit does some pretty good covers. Um, yep. This was yeah. my most recent uh, read was uh, Mystic Reborn by Jeffrey Spade. I've got a review. Uh, I got a review for that coming out for too long. Uh, just all uh, all independent. The independents are, are really because they know they need to stand out. Well, they need to stand out. And also they don't have a lot of the structure that um, that the advantages that traditional publishers have as far as like getting your book in front of audiences. And the I, I say it's a advantage the gatekeeping where like you know uh if you pick up a bane book or a tour book you know this book has gotten to where it's gotten because uh a thousand other books have been rejected for that spot um and so you as long as you know that like what that publishing house is trying to produce aligns with your interests then you you can trust you know, that you're probably going to enjoy the book. There's, there's that advantage. The biggest, the biggest enemy of an aspiring writer, regardless of what structure they're in, traditional or otherwise, is obscurity. And that is the biggest hurdle that I think indie, indie writers face is there are thousands of books being published in that, in that space on a daily basis. And in order to stand out, you've got to build not just like a good 
a good story and, and uh, you know, a good world building and you know, all that stuff. Um, you've also got to be good at marketing. You've got to do all this, this exterior stuff. You got to get good at, at the social media thing. You've got to, you know, learn how to do all that other, other things that I'm not personally good at. Like I'm a hermit. <laughs> you know? and, I, I, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. It's, uh... you know, you, you've got to get, you've got to sort of build all that other stuff and covers is one of the ways covers are one of the ways that, that Indy has figured out how to, to excel uh, and learn how to, you know, stand out in a way that will draw attention. And like you said, they're doing what readers want. The thing that that traditional publishers kind of lose track of is the reader. <laughs> they they forget that the person that they're trying to sell to at the end of the day is a reader. And rather than telling you what they think you should want to read, uh, indies take the extra step of knowing what what readers want to read and producing yeah. that and giving them that uh delivering your readers expectations so yeah exactly. uh, there's, there's a i've noticed a couple of indie genres that are really good at that um one being the lit rpg genre which i have not read in unless you count like maybe ready player one uh or the the harem books they know they know what their fans want and they deliver what their fans want and yeah. uh there's a lot of books that are really successful in that regard. Um, oh yeah. No, I have HP hollow is sort of doing, um, harem books and she's just enormously successful and is like, why wasn't I doing this the whole time? Lit RPG. <laughs> I've done a little bit of reading in that and I, I really enjoy it. I'm a big gamer. Um, and I've started writing a little bit of lit, lit RPG, but, uh, it's not really my strong point. I will say the first middling review that Wraithbound got, was basically why wasn't this lit RPG? Like, why do we not have stats for all of these demons? And I'm like, because <laughs> it's not that kind of book. Um, I'm not doing that exact that exact thing. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they you give the readers what they want. There was nothing wrong with that. Uh, the the answer for the other thing could have dovetailed in this one question we got. Any advice on how to stand out in the in the publishing crowd? Um, well, Tim, you're traditionally published. I don't know if you uh, have any advice in that regard. I mean, the, the, you know, I would think it could apply to almost any author. Yeah. Yeah. It really is a, a matter of giving readers what they want and building a brand. Um, you know, the, the main way that authors in general sort of stand out and build a, build, they build a brand, they, um, they, build a fan base that is loyal to them, uh, newsletters, um, you know, finding, finding your people and then giving them exactly what they want. Like I go to a lot of conventions. I go to, um, world con world fantasy, a lot of local science fiction conventions to me. Um, and all of those cons are great, but they're kind of broad. And so it's hard to, do exactly not exactly what I what I do, um, but this last year I went to Dragon Steel, which is Sanderson's personal convention, and I sold so many books. Uh, I sold out of like however many copies of Night Watch that I had, uh, and it was like forty. I sold out of those halfway through day one and to two day convention, and so it was one of those situations where I was suddenly in an environment where every reader who was there uh, wanted exactly what I was producing and being able to find that audience that, you know, your audience, you know what they want and you produce exactly what they want. Um, it takes some experimenting and figuring out what your voice is and, and you know, what, what your audience is. Uh, and then you got to find them. That's, kind of part of the problem is you know there are all these internet groups on facebook and stuff out there you know sword and sorcery groups and stuff you can't just go in there and start promoting your stuff because the mods will kick you out so you, you gotta <laughs> become part of a community and then grow from that community your your organic you know kind of well campus. that's that was the whole impetus for the creation of this show was being able to uh be you know a, a different communities being able to find uh an author they might not have heard of before and say and you know listening to them talk what they write and what they uh what 
what kind of process they have and saying, you know, that sounds like the author for me. Um, and going back to uh, going back to this, because I don't want to uh, take the whole show and not uh, talk about your release. This was uh, uh, this was your latest release on I think it was April uh, earlier this month. April 4th is uh, Wraithbound published by Bane Books, man. Uh, tell me about Wraithbound. So, like I said, it started off with this idea of a guy who had a ghost stuck in his head. And uh, I wanted to come up with a magic system or a cosmology in which that made sense. And I'm not going to bore you with the entire cosmology, but the basic idea is there's this magic system where um, there are eight planes of existence, uh, the four elemental planes, earth, fire, um, air, and water, and four what I call arcane planes, which are life, death, order, and chaos. Um, and each of these planes has uh, denizens, has spirits that exist on those planes. And then there's the, the material plane in the middle of that, that sort of group of eight, um, where all, of, all eight of those kind of flow together. Um, and a mage is a, what's called a spirit binder, uh, is able to take their soul and they fray the edge of their soul and they weave their soul into, um, into a spirit from one of those planes. It's kind of like having it, um, well, it's bound, you're, you're bound, it's bound to your soul. Um, so, uh, for example, you can, you can then use that, that connection to either bring that elemental spirit into the material plane and then do elemental spirit stuff, or you can use it kind of as an anchor and drive yourself into that other plane, that other material plane, so that you can um, enter the plane of death. You can uh, see the people who have, around you who have died recently. It's called the Shadowlands. Um, or you can enter the plane of life, which has benefits. You know, there are things that you can do there that you can't do in the material plane, or you can enter the plane of storm or whatever. Um, and our main care, the, the, that's sort of the magic system, right? So the world is one in which, uh, the, the, the planes of law and or of order and chaos are traditionally what we would, we would think of as heaven and hell. It's not quite accurate because, uh, chaos is not necessarily evil and order is not necessarily good but chaos is destructive and order is constructive and there are good and bad parts to that in, 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 you know, various ways. So, um, but we think of, of, you know, so they call the spirits of chaos demons, the spirits of, of order, they call angels. Um, and so, uh, they're always constantly at war. Uh, and in this world, uh, on the material plane, uh, chaos has already won. Um, the world is already falling apart. And so uh, the world is very slowly, f literally falling apart. Uh, and people have fought back uh, and they've created these magical barriers called order walls, which uh, keep chaos out. Uh, but they, they're very slowly failing. And so there's this, this system of like the world is slowly getting smaller and smaller and smaller as chaos begins to encroach on on reality um and there is a um there's a, a law enforcement group that tries to maintain order literally order not just like you know hey you don't jaywalk but like there's a demon in that building we have to go kill it um and they're very intolerant of any kind of like shenanigans so uh, they're, they're a little bit fascist. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, uh, there's, there's this tension between people just trying to live their lives, uh, and the very real danger that, that chaos sort of presents in the world. And so our main character is this guy named Ray. And when Ray was a kid, his dad was a, uh, storm binder, a, a binder of a spirit of air, um, and his job was just essentially to do weather control, to make sure that it rained on, on the crops for this, in the service of a baron. Uh, and his job was just to make sure that the baron's crops got rained 
you know, at the appropriate times. And that storms that came through that were too bad uh, or that were dangerous were uh, tamped down and dispersed. Uh, and it turned out that his boss, the Baron, was involved with some really shady people. And it created this um, this controversy, right? This this disaster uh, in in Ray's life, and uh, all of the people who were in the employment of Baron were arrested and shipped shipped off to gulags, essentially. And his dad ran away with his family, and is now living on the edge of edge of civilization, uh, hiding the fact that he is, was any way involved with this. He was an innocent guy at the wrong place at the wrong time. But because of it, he can't use his powers anymore because he can't let anybody know that he's a Stormbinder because um, because the the magic system is very um, re regulated by by these cops, essentially. Uh, and so he, they've, they've been living in hiding for the longest time. And Ray's not happy with that. So for 10 years, he's been living in the middle of nowhere uh, and wants to get back to the big city basically. And so he tries to teach himself the magic system. Uh, and he's doing it with his dad's old books. Uh, and he's doing it behind his dad's back and behind the back of the law, you know? Uh, and he tries to bind a spirit of storm like his dad did. Um, but in so doing uh, mistakenly binds the wraith of a murdered mage to his soul. Uh, and that sets off a whole series of problems <laughs> because they're the people who murdered that guy don't want it to be known. Uh, and uh, he's finds himself on the run and then things get crazy. The world begins to fall apart. He finds himself hunted by a demonic cabal of assassins uh, and uh, needs to figure out why this is happening and um, how he's going to, you know, escape and also how to use how to how to control this wraith because the wraith really has ideas of its own that it wants to prosecute and so uh he's he's in a, a bad situation um uh, from pretty much minute one so it's a lot of action a lot of fight scenes uh you have this demon thing here in the middle of the middle of the screen who uh has this this lovely sword that's just a a, a length of molten chain uh, that he whips out and then it cinches together and he kills people with it. So I didn't notice that until you pointed that out. And that is really cool. That That is a really cool visual to have. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a flintlock fantasy, right? So the, the base technology level is um, probably mid 18th century. Um, there are a lot of, one of the things that I don't like about high magic systems is that mages are suddenly the only important characters and so there's this whole system built in where uh, you can take the magic and then bind it to physical things. So you can have a sword that has the spirit of an angel bound to it. And that makes the sword powerful. Or with the flintlocks, uh, you can take the spirit of stone and bind it to the bullets. And so when it fires, after it fires, it then summons... Uh, an, el an element of stone to it or earth and becomes 80 times as heavy. And so it hits with an enormous amount of force um, or it blows up because it's got a fire spirit attached to it or something. So the magic system is distributed, you know, more than just, uh, just mages have access to it. If there's one thing uh, fantasy fans like, especially these days, it's, it's magic systems and having to, having to learn a new system when they, you know, pick up new books. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry about that. I, I I never really put much thought into those in my own works, but uh, when it came to uh, writing uh, my first book and the subsequent second starting point uh, sequel, uh, I realized I kind of had to need. Uh, I kind of needed one, so you know, I kind of was. It only the... matters if it is central to your plot, and that's right. one of the things that Sanderson has like he's made a lot of fans uh, and people are like, Oh, well, that worked really well for him. So let's do that. Uh, and some <laughs> people do it well and some people do it not so well. Um, so I, I don't think you absolutely have to do that. Um, there's a lot of really great magic systems out there or really great fantasy novels out there where the magic system is basically, it just works, you know, uh, yeah. and it, it doesn't matter as much. 
Um, You'll see a lot of older school fans who much prefer a, a softer magic system, the, yeah. the kind of stuff you find in like Dragon Lancer or Conan, or you know, where it's just they do magic and it works, and uh, or or it's got some kind of you know a positive or negative connotation to it uh, on its use, depending on who's using it. But I, th I think Sanderson definitely kind of. Sorry about that. I keep hearing explosions, and I figured it's either a gun or a meth lab exploding, depending on uh, what day it is. Um, the uh, I think Sanderson's definitely brought like magic systems is is kind of a thing a lot of people expect from fantasy now. Um, yeah, whether that's a good or a bad thing is definitely going to depend on the reader. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, not not you know it was kind of like in the wake of Harry Potter, everybody all of a sudden had a magic school. Well, I think the the thing that I don't like about Sanderson systems they become so central that they overwhelm everything else and it starts I, to feel like radio and you know uh it starts to feel like engineering instructions right yeah which i've i'm never going to do that like it's always going to be um an action sequence for me <laughs> you know you're going to learn how the magic works by watching you know some demon pop out of the world and rip some guy's face off that's your tutorial you know <laughs> oh taking taking cues from dark souls i see yeah right exactly <laughs> You mentioned before you were a big gamer. Is uh, what kind of uh, games do you play? So video games. Honestly, um, the majority of my time is spent in World of Warcraft, and that's because my wife and I both play, and that is our family time. So um, she's one of our one of our guilds uh, raid officers. <laughs> so one of the DPS officers. Um, so yeah, it's. I play a lot of World of Warcraft, basically. I play yeah. other games. I play them casually. I play um, Lost Ark. I play Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy has a big influence on oh. everything that I've written. Um, that combination of weird, dark stuff combined with technology, combined with humor, you know? Um, yeah. Is this, that's a, that's a great aesthetic as far as I'm concerned. Uh, oh, my wait, second I novel, Horns of Ruin, was basically a love letter to to final fantasy um so that's that's the core of it yeah, i've, I've um, enjoyed a lot of those games not not all of them but uh yeah my first and favorite was nine easily yeah, yeah nine's a good game and nine's like i introduced my kids to that not that long ago and uh <clears throat> it, I, I love genre, jrpgs in general like that is uh at the same time that i found uh the fantasy genre in literature uh, in the late nineties was the exact same time that I learned how to play JRPGs. Cause as a gamer and, and as someone who probably uh, because I had learning disabilities and a lot of other things growing up, I, I very highly suspect these days that I grew up with undiagnosed high functioning autism mm -hmm. uh, looking back <clears throat> something that I grew, I kind of grew out of in a lot of ways. Uh, Something about JRPGs just did not click in how to play them. Mm. And it was the same with tabletop RPGs. Uh, whereas I come in the late with the, the uh, tabletop RPGs, something clicked when my friend sat me down and said, okay, look, I'm just going to, he showed me Final Fantasy VI. He, he fought the final boss for me. And he's like, play this one or play, I'm going to we'll help walk you through the opening chapters of this one. Yeah. And uh, it finally clicked and I started to get into it better because, I like those. They they feel like the epic fantasies novels of the video game, you know, world in in a lot of ways. Yeah, they're epic. They are epic, and they are better at storytelling, I think, than than most American based RPG systems are. Um, and you know, again, I see that as a, as a adamant war, a WoW player. That um, WoW storytelling to me is one of those areas that they just kind of follow. They fall behind on. They do a lot of lore. They, you know, they're people that I know that are big lore, lore fans. But you can play the games without knowing any of the lore, and I think that kind of ruins the lore because uh, you don't have to engage with it. Whereas when you play a JRPG, you are inherently drawn into the story uh, in a way that I think other other games kind of don't don't succeed yeah. personally. I regret that I could not play WoW when it was like in its zenith, when it was initially its most uh, popular. But for a lot of my life, like all my computers were secondhand up until a couple, believe it or not, a couple up until a couple of years ago, I did not ever shell out the 
money for a brand spanking new computer that could run uh that could run something like wow like i was uh uh i was always get second hand or used computers and you know stuff that was lagged so far behind you know just playing starcraft in 2009 would have uh made it start smoking a little bit it, yeah. yeah so i kind of missed that because when it comes to uh i love the a lot of the storytelling and lore behind wow and their orcs are who i model my orcs after you know oh, from an aesthetic sense they're, they're like prime orcs like that you yes you know, those guys love orcs clearly <laughs> that is that is part of it I'm, I'm a horde player so uh I'm <laughs> on that side of of the uh, of the game so it's yeah, yeah it's um uh, and i and i kind of can't go back and you know relive the glory years it's, it's a little too over for me you know but i kind of wish i could have but you know it, as long as the computer let me write that was the only thing i ever needed a computer to do so I, I that was just me, you know. But, but God dog, I love I love their orcs. I, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, they do the orc right. They do, and that's kind of where that's the inspiration for my orcs that I take from. Uh, oh no, we got some we got some WoW players in the chat. Oh gosh. Oh no. Um, for the horde. Oh, no. <laughs> um, I enjoyed it. So uh, back to uh, what well, we got you here. Back to uh, Wraithbound. Is there anything more you want to uh, say about that? I didn't want to interrupt you, but uh, um, I do like video game talk. I ain't going to lie. When, when there's a new series, uh, people always are concerned that it's not going to get finished. And I, I will tell you, um, I write a book every eight months. Um, I am currently writing the third Nightwatch book. But as soon as that is done, I'm going to write books two and three of Wraithbound sequentially. So that they're going to be like by the end of this year. What is this, April? Probably by the end of the year, I'll be done with the trilogy. Um, now, it will take a little while for Bain to actually publish those books because publishing schedules were weird. Um, but, you know, you do not have to worry about uh, this this series not getting finished. Uh, that that so has been that has been a, a, a weird little uh, a weird quibble for a lot of fantasy fans. And the strange thing is that really only comes up from two authors. Yeah, Martin uh, and Rothfuss. Yeah, exactly. And uh, there are other I can understand. Well, I understand a lot of them don't want to get involved with it, and it never get done. Like uh, what happened with poor Robert Jordan, although his story at least had an end. Yeah, we're. I'm of the belief that uh, Martin's not going to. Even if we get Winds of Winter, we'll never get that last book. No, I don't. I don't think so either. I think he he took all of his ideas and helped them write the the show and therefore no longer feels compelled to finish the series. He's not hungry anymore. Yeah. So uh, I agree. I don't think we'll ever see Rothfuss third book personally. No, um, I never, no, I've heard good things about Rothfuss's books, but I loved book one. I was unimpressed by book two. I know a lot of folks really liked book two. Nothing happened. Nothing actually happened in that book. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not going to read him until he finish unless he finishes the third book. I feel like there's no reason for me to get invested. Then, yeah, if, there's no reason for me to get invested if he's not if it's not ever going to have an end. Yeah. And you know, I so. and that's that's really part of the problem is that book one was, in my opinion, so good that people really wanted you know the rest of it to to finish out. Um, Would it make sense to read book one and just never touch any of them again? Or you're going to be does really it really make you want to read more? It makes you want to read more. Oh. So then I would stay away probably, but, <laughs> um, but like Martin, you know, I don't know that um, he'll ever finish. There are other prominent like Scott Lynch, um, the Liza Locke, Lamora, that series. I did not know that he already planned out five books. Like if you go to the Liza Locke, Lamora Wikipedia page, mm -hmm. the titles of all five or eight or however many there are books are, are there. Um, but, we're like 10 years past something like that. Some significant period of time past the third book coming out. Uh, and there's been no indication of when it's coming out. Now, Scott's a friend. I wish he would finish the series. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's contributing to that, but there are writers who take a lot of time and that's just, that's just the way they write, you know? Yeah. 
I, I think a certain level of I think a certain level of you know waiting is you know readers kind of have a you know a, a little bit of understanding that it can take a little time, and to wait and get the you know the book that you want. I think in uh, I, now Rothfuss, I don't know about him or where that's at or, if, or what his excuse is. I know with Martin, um, he's proven in the last twelve years. It's been twelve years since the last book. Twelve years. Yeah. And here's the thing that kind of sticks in my craw. He's written other books. Oh yeah, he's busy. He'll like, read. He'll working. write anything but the next book. Yeah. It seems. Yeah, he's he stays busy. He's just not writing, not finishing this this series. So yeah, yeah it's and it's frustrating. For my from my perspective, kind of seeing how he writes, the pacing and everything that needs to happen before the end of the books. I, honest to God, do not think he could finish those books in two books. I don't think yeah. he could get everyone where they need to be uh, and all the events to happen well, in I'm just two books. I'm forgetting. Isn't the last book that is actually published uh, only half of the storylines? Right. And it was like, the book that's supposed to come out next is supposed to be the other half of those storylines. And so, like, from a timeline perspective even if this book comes out, the timeline is not actually going to advance because like that book is going to end on the same day as the previous book. Is is that, am I forgetting that or am I, it's been that, so long since I read them. That sounds like uh, one of the books in uh wheel of time, I think is described like that. Like the entire book takes over the, takes course over the uh, one whole day. Well, yeah, that's one of the last, the last books in the series. Cause it's the final battle. Like it's, the entire book is the final battle. Uh, no, I mean one of the ones Robert Jordan wrote before oh, really? he passed. Okay. I think I heard one of the, it's in one of the that little three book uh, area that's officially known by his fandom as the slog. Ah. Uh, in that a lot of stuff is going on, but nothing actually happens. Yeah. Uh, and see, that's that's the kind of like epic fantasy that I don't write. Uh, yeah. And I get why it's easy to like fall into that trap. But um, I want things to happen. <laughs> Call me crazy. No, I understand. And hey, I, I can see I can see why just based on those popular, those are just the two popular ones. Like a lot of other uh, authors have finished, you know, plenty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, uh, it when you go into your uh, books, you, you kind of plot them out as like a trilogy to make sure that you're not going on nine books. I go I go between three books and five like the. The race balance is going to be three books. Blade Caster is going to be five, but I'm trying to figure out the structure of Blade Blade Caster. I'm trying to. There's this thing with how Barnes and Noble is taking care is doing series now, where it is very hard to get. Um, like if you write a, a trilogy, it's hard to get books two and three on shelves. They'll carry book one, but they won't carry books two and three, and it's not good <laughs> for public. Huh. Um, and so I'm trying to come up with a way to produce a lot of content, um, but have it all be standalones, but still interconnected. So I'm still thinking about that. I haven't figured it out yet, but uh, yeah, it's not like, I, I, I have definitely seen a lot of, a lot of fantasy fans fit, uh, kind of have that, like wanting more standalone novels. Yeah. I think I'm not trying to get infested, but it's going to be very intentional and it's going to be difficult because like I, like I said, I write big ideas. I write big epic stories and it's hard to, to get an entire, unless you're putting out a 500,000 word book, which you can do. Um, you know, it's hard to get the whole thing into one book. Um, so we'll see. <laughs> and <clears throat> Wraithbound has it, how has it done so far, man? Are you, are you really uh, uh, proud of this one? You feel like you've, uh, Managed to get uh, get uh, this book in a place like like all my all my other books are good, but this one right here is the one that really shines. It's definitely the best book that I've written. Um, it's I'm I'm very happy with it. Um, it's doing okay. It's hard to say. You have to understand that when like okay, I got a royalty statement from Bain in. September of 2022. That's the most recent one that I've got. September or October? October. Um, and it covered the sales period uh, 
that ended in December 2021, right? So that is me seeing the sales for the books uh, that you wrote 12, last year. Yeah, you know, <laughs> eight months, nine months after after they're out, um, and you don't even see uh, you don't see sales for books that have not been on shelves at least six months prior to the, the sales period. So like in November of 2022, I had a book that came out in February, 2022. That book did not appear on the sales royalty statement at all. So uh, there's about an 18 month lag um, between a book coming out and me seeing legitimate sales numbers. Um, I do see book scan numbers, but they don't capture any of my ebooks they don't capture audiobooks and they don't capture about a third of overall bookstore sales so i don't really have a good sense of how books are doing um, <laughs> well you know, uh um uh, it's all vibes I'm, I'm used to i i guess i'm used to uh uh more indie authors you know and they kind of open up amazon and see how it's doing you know well, they've got yeah i i have hybrid books i have books that i've put out myself or not really books. I have short stories and, and novellas and stuff that I put out myself. And yeah, I have a daily report on, on those sales. Um, but like race bound, eh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and I'm not going to well, know until probably, uh, you know, middle of next year. At the well, earliest. Let's, let's hope we can get you a, a few more fans of this. So, you know, if everyone's, uh, if, if you had to ask, uh, if you had to tell uh, the folks listening, What's the best place to start? Like, it sounds like Wraithbound would be yeah. it. Yeah, definitely Wraithbound. Um, Wraithbound is, you know, it's my new series. It's uh, the best book I've written. And it's definitely, um, you know, it's, it's, I've got big plans for it. Let's just say that. Like, I could write 20 books in this world pretty easily if I, if, if I sell enough copies. So I, I would like to write a lot more Wraithbound. I've got some good ideas. If you like that sort of dark epic fantasy, if you like action-packed stuff, then that's definitely the way to go. I will say, if you like lighter stuff, um, Nightwatch uh, here is um, Men in Black at the Renaissance Fair. It's Library Journal called it a mix of Jim Butcher and Terry Pratchett. Now, huh. those are kind of big names. Um, I, you know, I don't necessarily want to conjure by those names, but library journal did. So I'd be a fool not to mention it. Um, and I dig yeah. that cover. That is a really, uh, that's yeah. a really nice, vibrant, colorful cover. Yeah. And cover. you can never go, you never go wrong with a dragon on your cover. Gotta love a dragon. <clears throat> Planning it myself well. a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, Tim, I want to, uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and start wrapping this up and I want to. Sure. Thank you for uh, coming on tonight and just, you know, talking a little shop, talking a little writing, because a lot of uh, aspiring authors or, you know, indie authors uh, follow the channel and they're always eager to see what somebody else's process is, what somebody else's thoughts are, uh, you know, on writing and, you know, how they got to where they are, uh, you know, how they come to their conclusion. You get a little bit of overlap, but like we said earlier, I think a lot of uh, people are, I think a lot of writers bring something different and unique to uh every book that they write yeah yeah no yeah. i agree with that and i would say you know if you are a, a new writer or looking for advice on stuff or just want to talk shop um i'm the only tim acres you're going to be able to find online uh so look me up and i'm always willing to chat and yeah. you know i've i've got articles out there on on writing but i've also got just general general life advice that I, that I spout occasionally. So, And all his social media links and to his website and his books are going to be linked in the description of the awesome. video uh, for his, for your convenience, because that is what I like to do. I like to convenience my audience. It's a wise and choice. <clears throat> I, I kept at, uh, hold on, before I, before I end, I want to ask you one last question uh, because it kept coming up in my head and I never found a good spot to interject it. Are you one of those uh, writers that goes back and reads your own work at some point? No, no, no? I, will, I will read. Um, I'll read a book when I'm preparing to write the next book in the series. And that's just me getting my head back into the, um, 
back into the groove of yeah. that particular thing. Get back like, to the vibe Baradon of the world you're in. Nightwatch, and Nightwatch is different than the Veridon stuff. And so uh, if I'm going to write something in that world, I, I kind of have to get my head in that pace again. It's like just doing do a little bit of warm up, you know, jogging before I run. Um, <laughs> and so, but other than that, no, I don't. In fact, I don't like reading my own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like at, at once I'm done with it, I'm done with it. And I, I want to, you have to realize by the time a book gets on a shelf, I've been living with it for, you know, quite over some time. a year and four or five different revisions. Some books like Pagan Night, which is the first Hallowed War series book. Um, I lived with that book for five years almost because um, it took a long time to to produce and to get to a version that uh, my agent and I were both happy with. And even then, once it sold, it sold on the condition of a pretty significant rewrite. So, uh, yeah, I by the time that book came out, I was like, I'm never looking at that, at that again. I'm done with that. <laughs> uh, but then I had to do, you know, all the promotional stuff and go out and do readings and all that nonsense. So uh, I wasn't quite shut of it. But, um, yeah, it's it's challenging. So, no, I don't know. Real quick before we go, Paladin Dragoon Rider wanted to know about your minis. Um, okay, so I've been playing war games since the mid-'80s. Um, I started with Battletech. Uh, I started playing Warhammer 40k when it was called Rogue Trader and uh, was not yet Warhammer or anything. Um, and so I've got miniatures going back that far. Uh, and I have a room over there, which is, uh, it's a bathroom. It's the length of this wall, but it's just, uh, it's just shelves and shelves of minis. I'm not going to show you that, um, cause it's a mess, but, um, <laughs> These days, I mostly play a rank and flank game called Kings of War, which is kind of like Warhammer Fantasy Battle, but it's designed for tournament play. Um, so there's not a lot of bullshit going on. Um, and it is a model agnostic game, so you can use any miniatures for it uh, as long as they more or less look like what they're supposed to. So, like, I've got a bunch of Wrath of Kings models. I can show you. I've got a bunch of little elves here. Uh, Paladin Dragoon Rider is also a fan. Says King yeah, of Kings of War is great. Game. So yeah, I play. Uh, I just got back from Adepticon, uh, whatever that was last month. And uh, I have yeah. to confess, I've never been a I've never been a war gamer. Um, uh, mostly out of just it, the the a lot of effort. It's a lot of effort, uh, especially like 40k is the most uh, egregious example of that. Like everything I know about Warhammer 40k, I learned against my will. Yeah, well, the, the joy, I mean, like, I love the lore of, of 40K. And and, and it's uh, got some lore. Holy lore is amazing. shit. Um, but I, uh, it's it's a rough game to, to play. I also play I, Malifo. I'm one of Malifo's main writers, actually. So if you're a Malifo fan. Um, and it's expensive. It's a Victorian horror game. Uh, and it's cool because it's relatively easy to get into it. It's, you know, a yeah. small model count and stuff, so. That's the thing about Warhammer 40K is I know so much about it. I hear people talk about it and the minis, the Lord, everything. I don't know that I've ever heard anyone actually talk about how well good the game is. The game is terrible. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it really, I mean, I have friends who really enjoy the game, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, but they are people, the more that you, more games that you play, the more you realize that, wow, this is not a very good system. It's just and, like with D&D. &D. I mean, I, a lot of people love D&D. &D, that's great. Fifth edition, it's really kind of an average game. Um, there are so many good role playing games out there that just do everything that that D and D does, but well. <laughs> so uh, yeah, for for my money, it was easy to pick up and easy to learn, and that that a good that rock. made it a that made it a great thing to implement so, uh, with my family. So me and my kids play. Oh, understand? And, I'm still I like I play fifth edition monthly. I am in yeah. the same D and D campaign. It's my wife's D and D campaign from college. They've been playing for thirty years. You know, oh, wow. So it's not the same characters. We keep changing characters and, yeah. and all that stuff. But um, it's the same players. The same players since college. And so, um, yeah, it's you know, it's a system that everybody knows. It's it's a common language, but um, it, it's it's just not a great system. Like if you really get into <laughs> you know the detail. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it's, it's and, uh, what it is. It, it is. Yeah, it is what it is. Uh, Fly Fox Pro says you've sold one copy of Wraithbound tonight. So cool. Awesome. 
Um, I picked up I picked up an ebook for it as well. I, I can't promise I can get to it in a timely manner because my TBR is an unmitigated disaster at this point. But okay. my TBR, yeah, is pretty much that shelf. <laughs> it's not- but I'm but I'm glad to have you in my book, uh, my digital bookshelf, Tim. And I was I'm glad to have you here tonight. So thank you for uh, coming by to uh, stop by, talk shop and talk writing and uh, and you know help talk about your books because as we all know, authors don't really like to talk about their books that much, right? We like to. We're just. Not <laughs> <good>. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Uh, it's been a lot you, of fun. Thanks a lot. Uh, you have a good evening. Thank you to uh, everyone in the chat for dropping by, listening, and asking your wonderful questions too. Great questions tonight. I was glad to have you guys. And until next time, thank you all for coming by. Uh, I'm author John A. Douglas with Tim Aker Acres, and we'll see you next time.